you. Oh, I probably have to wake up my computer. There we go. Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks uh, for having me here and for all the sponsors who made this possible. Uh, this is my first time here, but I've always been wanting to come previously when it was Web Font Day, so it's uh, an honor to be here. Um, let's get started. Uh, I won't go on for too long here, but uh, just some of the things that I've done to introduce myself in case you're not as familiar with me and uh, the kind of work that I've been doing. Um, Tim did a pretty good job of doing all that stuff, though. Um, before I start, there's a few things I like to do just to get a general gauge of the situation. How many people here have designed typeface? Raise your hand. Okay, good. How many people here have designed a website? Okay, more. Uh, how many have designed a responsive website? Okay, good. I think this is about the audience that I was thinking for. So a little late response up here by Indra. Um, I also want to mention uh, just my presentation itself is a little interesting, so I'd like to explain it a little bit before I get too far into it. First of all, the it's all built with HTML, so if something goes wrong, it might not be that surprising, but uh, it seems to be working pretty well. Um, the other thing that I want to make a note of is the fonts that I'm using uh, are actually variable fonts, and this was made possible by my friend David Jonathan Ross. Um, he made me a variable font version of this typeface Gimlet, um, which I'm using throughout my slides. Um, so I have to thank him for that. Um, I also usually have a test slide just to make sure my, oh, it's getting cut off a little bit. That's okay. I think you'll still be able to see the captions. Um, all right, let's get started. Variable fonts. So the idea of uh, type and type systems that have kind of stylistic variation is nothing new. Um, going back to the days of metal type and letterpress printing, uh, every size that existed for a typeface had to have a different set of blocks, as you probably know. Um, but if you compare them, uh, you know, blown up to the same scale, you would see that usually they're not the same design, really. The, the stroke width and the contrast and other uh, factors would change. And that was to improve either readability or uh, problems with printing conditions. Um, but these were still kind of discrete designs that existed as part of a larger system. Uh, this was made possible in part by this machine and others like it. Uh, this is the Benton engraver invented by Lynn Boyd Benton from uh, American Type Founders Company. Um, and basically the way that it worked was you would have a pattern for a letter and uh, trace it and at a smaller scale it would cut the matrix for casting type. Um, it's not uh, that concept on itself, the panograph is not a new idea and it wasn't new when he came up with it. But what was interesting about the Benton engraver is it allowed um, some amount of semi-automated stylistic adjustment. So depending on the settings that you had for the machine, you could adjust the stroke weight uh, or the width of the character. Um, and they used this a lot for making smaller size versions from a, a single pattern. Uh, jumping forward quite a bit into the digital era, early digital era, there's Donald Knuth's Metafont. Um, probably some of you have heard of it. Uh, the general idea was that it was a way to define a typeface design based on a bunch of different variables. Um, so you could uh, create kind of a family that had a related skeleton, but depending on the parameters that you fed the program, uh, it would give you different results. And this is a, there are still a lot of systems that are kind of based on this. 
it's not perfect because it's very hard to get high quality typeface design uh, using just parameters. Um, so it is a little bit limiting, but it's still very interesting in, in the context of variable type. There's also uh, Herit Nordzeit, which many of you have probably heard of before. Um, and he was a big proponent and taught a lot of people about thinking about a typeface not necessarily as a fixed design, but kind of as uh, an instance somewhere in a design space, depending on any number of variables. Um, and he wrote a lot about this and taught a lot of people about it, including uh, my friend Eric Van Blocklin. And this is a quote that uh, I always like to show when thinking about variable type. Um, and it also, I think, applies to things other than fonts. Um, but it's basically about thinking of uh, type as more of a dynamic system than as these fixed instances. Um, Eric Van Blocklin developed this program called Superpolator. How many people here have used Superpolator? Okay, I'm going to do a quick demo then, because this is really cool if you're not familiar with it. Um, so the idea behind Superpolator also is not extremely new or novel. It's just a, a nice implementation of the idea. Um, and this is the idea of interpolation. And so basically the concept is if you design different styles, different variants of a typeface, the light, black, condensed light, condensed black. Oh. Superpolator is breaking up the world. <laughs> May I? Yeah. Is it because I changed? I blame Eric. Okay. That works. I might have to change it back after, but. So to go back to what I was saying, the general idea is if you have these uh, individual styles, you can mathematically uh, get an average anywhere in between them. And this is pretty typical for how most people design typefaces that you know, have a large number of variants, or weights, or widths, or optical sizes, or things like that. Um, and so type designer is very comfortable working in this kind of mindset. And there are other tools that do this, um, built into glyphs, and even FontLab has something similar. But um, unfortunately, when it comes to the end user, when you have to provide the fonts to them, they basically just get the fixed static uh, versions of the, the typeface, which is not uh, keeping this idea of interpolation and scalability in mind. Uh, there have been some previous formats. This is from the 90s, the TrueType GX format, um, which basically uh, allowed the type designer to keep this flexibility in mind and have these different axes of variation. Um, also allowed for predefined instances for people who didn't like dealing with sliders. Um, this is Skia, which actually, the typeface Skia, which comes on everyone's Mac even today and is still delivered in this format. Um, but unfortunately, the interface to interact it with it like this uh, went away a while ago. Um, there are many kind of political and technical reasons why this format or other formats like it, like multiple master fonts from Adobe, um, didn't make it past the 90s. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about that later. But this is just to say that there's a precedent for this in the digital era, even. Um, but pre-digital, uh, well, maybe not pre-digital, but at least before the web was a large thing that everyone knew about, Walter Tracy was talking about a lot of these ideas of making a typeface uh, kind of responsive and uh, 
being aware of its situation and adjusting its design accordingly. Uh, this is from 1986, so yeah, before most people were using the web or even uh, the web existed in one, the way it does now. Um, there is this concept of hinting, though, which a lot of people talk about, especially when it comes to marketing fonts. A lot of people throw this word hinting around. Um, and I don't feel like a lot of end users necessarily understand what it does other than making type look good on the screen. Um, but actually, the technology behind it is has a lot in common with these ideas of variability and changing things according to the, the size and the context. Um, so I have a slide here that shows how with Georgia. Normal form, the normal outlines. Um, but in systems that use hinting or support hinting, um, can kind of detect the size that it's being rendered at, how many pixels are being used to render it, basically twist, get them to fit better into this grid. Maybe I should adjust this. I feel like I'm starting to feed back here. OK. Mm -hmm. OK, sorry about that. I didn't tell you, but this was going to be a noise art performance as well. Uh, but to get back to hinting, as you can see, there's some really weird things going on with the outlines after hinting has been applied to it. Um, so like here, you see this corner of the A gets really distorted. And it looks like an error, but actually, it's intentional. And the reason is that if this just continued as you might expect it to, this pixel down here probably would fill in. And so whoever applied the hinting to this, most likely Tom Rickner, uh, made the conscious decision to push this outline way far out of the way, knowing that no one would ever actually see this outline as it is. What they would see is the result of it being rendered on a grid of pixels. So that's kind of a crash course in how hinting works. And it's, it's an interesting idea of how to adjust a design depending on the context that it exists in. Um, there are other similar things. This is Sitka from Microsoft. Um, it doesn't work by hinting, but um, more based on ideas of interpolation. Um, and the original concept for it was that um, it would be kind of a variable font that would change depending on the size that people were using it. Um, and it does work that way um, if you use it, I think, in Microsoft Word or some other uh, native apps. Depending on the size that it's being set, the design will change. Um, there are, uh, I think, six levels of optical sizes. Um, and it happens automatically. The user doesn't have to think about it. And actually, some users probably don't even know that it's happening. But it makes it nice so that the headlines look more sharp and then the smaller stuff is more readable. Um, unfortunately, they had to ship this as individual uh, standalone fonts. So it's not one font that's changing. It's more a series of fonts um, that are being triggered depending on the size. Um, taking these ideas to the web has been interesting over the, the past few years because, um, as many of you know, I saw so many hands that went up for responsive design. The idea of having a flexible layout and flexible design system uh, is inherent in responsive design. Unfortunately, when it gets down to the level of the typeface and characteristics of a typeface, like the weight and the width and the X height and everything like that, uh, the fonts that we're used to using are just kind of fixed 
in their design, um, even though they exist in this very flexible system. And the way I've described it before is that uh, the fonts are kind of like these frozen ice cubes that are floating around in a sea of otherwise flexible uh, layout. And so I, I started thinking about this several years ago. Um, I wrote an article in 2013 that started talking about how concepts from hinting could be applied to uh, responsive design on the web. This was at a list apart. Uh, and I kept writing for them. I wrote another article uh, named Variable Fonts for Responsive Design. So it's very uh, topical to what I'm talking about these days. But this was basically me saying that I thought that these things should exist. And, and finally, uh, they're starting to come around. Unfortunately, in the meantime, uh, while it wasn't possible to do some of these things, and while still in a practical way it's not, there you have to do a little bit of hacking, um, both for the web and for um, other formats. So in InDesign, some of you may be familiar with this panel. This is the justification setting in InDesign. And you'll see there's some stuff here which is starting to move in the direction of thinking about fonts that are a little bit more scalable than, oh. I can't blame Eric on this one. Go straight to the source here. Okay. Let's Thank you again. Um, so yeah, this is for print, and already you can see, and this is, I don't know how long this feature has existed in InDesign, but it looks to this uh, kind of future of having type that's a little bit more flexible to give you um, more subtle adjustments when you need it. For example, in settings of justification where maybe you want it just a little tiny bit tighter or wider or whatever. Um, and then some people started using this on the web. This is a list apart again. Um, and previously they had it set up so that um, they were using Georgia in when you're on a wider screen. But when you get into a narrower device like a phone, then uh, it would switch to a narrow version of Georgia, which allowed for a little bit more uh, text per each line. And there wasn't as much line breaking going on. Something's buzzing now, but I think that's. That's just part of my uh, noise art performance here. Um, I developed a tool with my friend Chris Lewis called Font to Width. And I have that open here somewhere. Um, the basic idea of Font to Width is it's a JavaScript uh, tool. Oh, that's not what I wanted. That allows you to set type in a box, and then depending on the width of the box, it will choose another uh, variation of the typeface in order to fill it out. This looks very much like what we wanted it to do, but actually what's going on is we have, I think, at least seven different widths of this typeface. So these are just static fonts um, that are being swapped out depending on uh, the width of the box that they sit in and the text that's in the box. Um, another kind of intermediate concept, again from Eric von Blockland, is this idea of using SVG and uh, kind of outline graphics to do things that allow type and text to be kind of flexible and animated. Um, there are a few examples that I really like. This is uh, cool because as the window expands, you can see the swashes grow, but the middle stays more or less the same. Um, 
so it's not just scaling things linearly. It's, it's this idea of kind of interpolating between uh, different extremes. There's another really cool one uh, with Arabic where there's this swash that can be pretty much any width in order to be readable. Um, but as you can see, it kind of flexes in order to fill the page. There's another JavaScript library called plumin.js, which basically allows you uh, to hack the font data itself using JavaScript. Um, and this is getting much closer to the idea of actual variable fonts. Uh, it's a little bit buggy, and it can't do a lot of things, but it was definitely kind of a nice in-between option for at least headlines and things like that. Um, but while all these people were experimenting with these ways of making static fonts appear as though they were variable, um, there are actually some people at some very large technology companies who were talking about how to make this a reality um, to most end users without having to deal with hacks. And so earlier this year, um, there was an announcement at the A-Type I conference in Warsaw um, that this new, uh, it's not a new format, it's kind of an addition to the open type format that basically allows for this kind of variability in uh, open type fonts. Uh, there's an announcement of it online if you want to see the full thing, but um, this was, as someone who was writing about this for years and thinking about this and talking about it and making hacks to get around this, this was kind of a really big deal for me. Um, this is an article that John Hudson wrote. This is kind of the official announcement that explains everything in detail. Um, check it out if you want to know the full uh, story. But yeah, like I said, this was kind of a big deal for me and a lot of people who have been thinking about this stuff for years. Uh, other people have been thinking about it for decades. So it fundamentally changes a lot of things that people presume about type and how type is used. So it's kind of a game changer. Uh, part of the reason that is is because of the people that are involved in making it a reality. Adobe, Apple, Google, Microsoft, the W3C, uh, all the font editing, font editing software manufacturers that I know of, font publishers, and then just individual people. I mean, it's pretty rare to get this many people all on board on the same thing, especially when you're talking about Adobe and Apple and Google and Microsoft. There are not many things that um, they agree on and collaborate with on. And that's part of the reason why some of these previous formats that existed didn't really make it in the 90s, uh, because you know maybe Apple was working on it, but they weren't in collaboration with another company um, who wouldn't support it in their software, and so it was kind of uh, dead on arrival. So what exactly are these variable fonts, and how do they work? Um, you probably understand by now, but I'll, I'm going to explain it just uh, visually to help in case you didn't. Uh, typically now when we're making something we have these static font files. Each one has a fixed design with its own uh, information about it. Um, but they're pretty much uh, separate from each other. They don't, other than maybe the uh, shared font name and position in the, in the font menu, um, they don't really interact with each other all that much. Um, with this new variable font uh, addition to OpenType, Basically, there's one set of outlines that are stored in the font file, but then there's information about how to adapt that outline to other styles. Um, so it's a lot more efficient as far as file size. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but it also is great because it allows for much more flexibility with the design and adaptability. And the way that it does this is with this thing called deltas. And this took me kind of a while to fully understand what it was because unlike superpolator where I showed you, um, like with superpolator you have one outline and then you have another outline and they have matching point structures, the same number of points. Um, and when you kind of superimpose them, that means that you can do an average to get something in between. It's actually as far as math goes, uh, pretty straightforward just averaging and percentages. 
the way that the new variable fonts uh, technology works, though, is a little bit different. And it's a subtle differentiation, but it's very interesting when you start getting into the idea of um, kind of more advanced type design. And that's by using these things called deltas. So if you compare the two outlines that I had before, there are these differences between the points. Um, it's pretty straightforward. If you want to move from one to the other, you have to go up over, and, uh, and that number is actually what is stored in a variable font. So this is more what it looks like in the variable font format. You have one outline, and then information about how those points travel and the distance that they can travel. Um, and it's kind of a subtle distinction between storing multiple outlines and storing just one outline, um, but it allows for things uh, that are much that can be much more efficient as far as file size saving and also just uh, more interesting design uh, possibilities. So yeah, this just kind of shows that you can only you can get multiple styles from one set of outlines. Um, and why would you want to do this? I've, I've mentioned a couple times why, but I'll, I'll just kind of go through them one by one. Uh, the first one that I really think is cool and great for responsive design is having a flexible typeface that isn't fixed and uh, you can use it however you want and adjust the settings however you want. Um, it could also be used for corrective adjustments, uh, things like grades in print, or even if you wanted to adjust the weight subtly depending on the resolution, if you know the resolution of the screen. Uh, you can, of course, do fun things with animation. We saw some of that with what Eric was doing. Um, more advanced justification settings, kind of taking that idea of the InDesign uh, glyph scaling, but instead of squishing the type to actually use a, a better designed version of it. Um, but the thing that actually, I think, made this a reality at all these large tech companies is not so much the design flexibility, but more uh, the practical functionality of being able to compress a lot of fonts into one uh, font file, or at least small, smaller number of font files. Um, this is great for Western fonts, uh, and I'll show a slide later kind of talking about that, but it's even more important for Asian fonts, which may have thousands and thousands of glyphs, um, and if you can uh, reduce the number of fonts for that, it, you can save a lot of space, especially if you're trying to put something on uh, a watch or something like that, there, where there's limited space. So this actually is information about um, this my presentation here and the fonts that I used for the presentation um, is based on a previous template that I had made where I was using six individual styles of Gimlet um, which meant that I had to have six individual font files uh, and that meant that the the amount of data and if this was on the web the download time uh, is much higher than the way I have it now which is just uh, one variable font, and it's kind of adjusting uh, for the widths and weights that I need. So implementing this is actually not very hard if you're, if you're uh, familiar with CSS and how other things work in CSS. Um, oh, first I should talk about how it works when you're making the fonts. Um, this is kind of a step-by-step -step guide, which actually you don't, in theory, if you have uh, font source data, you don't necessarily need uh, a whole lot of other paid software to do this. It's kind of a hassle to go through step by step and do it this way, um, but there's a, a guide of how to do it. Also in glyphs, now there's a, a single step just kind of export functionality that was announced very recently, uh, last week. Um, so that, that's good for people who don't want to know the nuts and bolts of what's happening in, in the font. Um, but implementing it, uh, this is kind of a, the, the situation for using CSS with normal static fonts. Um, you specify the font files you want to use and which styles they should be used for. And then uh, 
you stylize each element accordingly. Um, it's pretty straightforward. With variable fonts, it's not a whole lot different. Um, the only difference is instead of mapping individual files, you have to think about it more of mapping different variables. So using Gimlet as an example and my presentation as an example, these are the six styles that I used. And these are all the um, kind of settings for optical size and width and weight that I had to use to achieve each of these uh, named styles. Um, so I'm using it pretty straightforward in a pretty static way. Um, I'm just calling out six individual things. Um, but the way you do that is um, where you were calling multiple files before, you just call one file. And then for each element, instead of changing the font family, you just change the settings that are used for that um, font. This is also, I should mention, it's kind of in, in the working draft, I think, for the W3C. It probably will sh end up something like this, um, but it's possible that this may change in the future. It's not official yet. Um, the places where you can use variable fonts, unfortunately, are still uh, pretty few. WebKit Nightly is where I'd say the most up-to-date support is for variable fonts. WebKit is the browser engine that runs Safari, and the Nightly version is kind of like the, the beta for the hyper geeks who want to get the most up-to-date version. Um, Similarly, there's the Safari Technology Preview, which is, it's not updated as frequently, but if something makes it into the Technology Preview, it means that it's almost definitely going to end up in Safari pretty soon. So currently, variable fonts are supported in the Technology Preview, um, so it's probably only a matter of time before it shows up in Safari and probably other browsers as well who will follow suit. Um, there's an app called Font View. Uh, which I think was one of the first ones that supported the new um, open type font variation spec. And I, have, I can do a little demo. I have it open here. It's pretty much what you would expect. Um, if you have a variable font, you can open it in here. And it shows you all of the axes that are built into the font. Um, so it's pretty good for testing that kind of stuff. Um, there's also this site called Axis Praxis by Lawrence Penny. Um, and it's a similar thing. It, you can just drag a variable font on there, and it will reveal all the sliders and the named instances that exist. Um, and there's also, it allows you to kind of test some of the uh, variable fonts that other people have been working on. Um, this is uh, where I'm testing a lot of my variable fonts lately because it's easy to just drag something on top. Um, but it's also kind of cool to see, I think this is a new one, um, just to see how other people are experimenting with variable fonts. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the examples that he has, this is that's new on there. Anyway, uh, some of these aren't available for licensing, but um, it's still cool to kind of see what people are playing around with. So speaking of which, let me take a drink of water here. Some people have been releasing variable fonts already, even though the announcement was only made two months ago, not even two months. Um, the first one that existed was uh, from CJ Dunn, and it was just a single glyph uh, that he was selling for a dollar. <laughs> and it's kind of a fun idea because, I don't know, it. it for me, it gave me some raw material to work with and do tests with. Um, but later on, he released the full type family. Um, this is his website. It's a pretty cool typeface. Um, but if you uh, license it, uh, if you license a whole series, he provides also a variable font. Um, there's kind of, he wrote kind of a nice article talking about it and um, how he got to that point. So that, as far as I know, was the first variable font that was uh, offered for sale to the general public in the new uh, format. There's also Gingham, 
which is uh, it's free and it's meant mostly for testing. So it's also helpful for people who are just kind of wanting to dip their toes in, in the technology. Um, my friend David Jonathan Ross, again, uh, made this cool kind of pixel-based variable font. So these are all variable fonts in here based on the same font. He just changes the setting for how round it is or how big the blocks are or how they're segmented. So I, I really like this is the kind of stuff that um, would be trickier to do uh, with a traditional interpolation concept, um, but it's nice that he can do this kind of experimental stuff. Uh, Adobe released a variable font that's actually in, not only is it a variable font, so it's new in that way, but it's in a new uh, say flavor of variable fonts, uh, the CFF outline format. I don't know, that's maybe getting a little bit too technical, but basically it's another um, project. It's an open source project, and it's meant for testing tools and for uh, getting people interested in, in looking at things. Uh, Underwear just released this really cool family called Zeitung. Um, this is their homepage right now, and it kind of shows off all these crazy things you can do with variable fonts. Um, but they've also done some kind of interesting stuff to make variable fonts work in InDesign, which I, I'm, run, I'm running low on time, but I think we have time to do this one thing. Um, so basically, they made this extension for InDesign that allows you to um, let's select them all here. Uh, use variable fonts in a design. Uh, it's kind of cool. And then also, if you kind of set something up, um, if you look at the the font style name up here, as I I don't know if you can even see that small, but it's a basically hacking it to use different styles for each. Um, variation. So that's another, I think that's one of the more most recent projects that are uh, using variable fonts, um, which brings up my last point about kind of what people have to think about in this uh, con context of variable fonts and using variable fonts is how do you sell these things? Um, there are different concepts that have been out there. Uh, CJ Dunn, like I mentioned before, has it that if you license a whole range of weights, then you just get those weights as a variable font, and I think that's a pretty smart idea. Um, other people have talked about doing kind of subsets of variable fonts, um, but it's kind of the Wild West at this point, so I'm sure we'll see a bunch of different uh, approaches to how this works, and uh, I don't imagine that there will be any one way that it's done. I'm sure people will have different ways of doing it. Um, keeping track of the stuff has been kind of interesting because it's very much a changing landscape, and I think it's hard to predict exactly what's going to happen in the future, um, but there are a few ways to kind of keep up with it. One of them is on GitHub, the W3C uh, has their CSS spec on there, and people are submitting issues related to variable fonts, and there's some interesting discussions about how, to, how they're going to implement variable font support in the CSS spec. Um, so I check this occasionally. Um, also on typedrawers.com, that's kind of the designated place um, for discussion about variable fonts. Um, a lot of them have this OTVAR label on, on the threads that they're talking about that kind of stuff. Um, but recently, I mean, there's just been so much stuff going on with this that I started this Variable Fonts Twitter account, which basically just gathers everything uh, that seems relevant into one place and uh, makes it a little easier to, to keep track of things. I use it uh, for myself just to have a reference, but also for other people who are interested in this, but they don't necessarily want to be hunting down every GitHub thread or anything like that. Um, but I think a lot of this, as I mentioned, it's kind of the Wild West, and we'll see a lot more interesting things coming out because this technology is brand new and people are only starting now to experiment. We have some variable sausage fonts that came out the other day. Um, 
but I'm really excited about it because it changes how people are thinking about type and thinking about using type, and it's definitely going to change, I think, especially on the web, how things uh, work in the future. So with that, thank you for having me. <laughs>